focusing on just academic learning hasn't produced what we've needed. We focus so much um, with the Millennium Development Goal on accessibility, so we opened up schools. What we know is that there are some core skills children need that help them do better for academic achievement later. And a lot of those things are critical thinking, learning how to communicate, how to collaborate with one another, problem solving. Those are lifelong skills that support you having better academic outcomes. So what we work on is creating spaces and facilitating um, high quality engagement with um, children that actually can promote those first things because they will lead to those later long term things. So academic achievement is important, particularly for parents, and we support academic achievement. But I'll give you an example. Academic achievement is very hard for a child to do in a language that's not his mother tongue. So, again, it's great because the child can gain so much from doing primary and early childhood, a rich mother tongue learning environment. We know we'll have better learning outcomes in that second language when the child is transitioned correctly to that second language that's there. I think it's not either or. I think you have to do both. Our vision is that we can become irrelevant. Our vision is that one day we don't need to have a separate space because the landscape has changed so radically. We have a whole bunch of child-centered spaces. Um, but schools can't stand alone. And I think that's sort of the fallacy is that we've asked education to be completely supported by the government as, as if education works, you know, in, in, in a silo. You know, when we think about education, education touches every sector of society. So why are we just asking the ministry of whatever country to take care of education, you know? So for us, it's also about how do we touch all those different parts of the system so that what's happening in classrooms is great. But maybe it's not happening in classrooms. There's some amazing programs um, that we know of, so partners of us, that are happening with parents in their homes and how parents set up learning environments for babies in their homes. So, you know, we really, it's really about rethinking, one, what do we know and understand about African children? And two, what do we really, what do we think and what do we want when we say reimagine learning? What do we mean by that? Because I think we've had a very classic sense of learning and we learning only learning equals academic. And I think that's old school. I don't think that works anymore. One, I think they're too teacher-centered. Teacher the teacher holds knowledge, and the teacher dispenses knowledge. Um, two, I think that they are based on creating a certain person for a certain type of society. When you have somebody who's holding and putting knowledge in, that person who's learning is really set to be a certain kind of person in society. Um, I don't think that that educational system, it will, because you'll have one or two who will slip by, but won't create the kind of people who can be resilient and respond to adaptive environments and be able to change and think about, hmm, where are the problems and how do we resolve them? That's the kind of person who kind of waits for a solution to come down and can implement the solution as it's being given. So I think that those are two real issues. Three, I worry about the content. Uh, I feel like we're not giving children real world content. I love history, I love mathematics, but I feel like we don't bring modern issues into the classroom. You know, 
um, so that for children, they, things aren't relational. You know, it's like you studied World War II, great, but how does World War II relate to what's actually going on here in West Africa? How does it relate to, you know, these, these, this new terrorist threat that we have, right? There's some real clear connections, but we don't always allow children to make those connections. Um, I also think the physical spaces that we're educating children in are not physical spaces that respect children. Uh, I also think we don't have respect for children's differences. Not everybody learns the same way. There's some children who have very special learning needs. We don't address them. I don't think uh, the current educational system is geared for children who are poor or living in rural communities. They tend to have the least quality education. So I think there's a lot of things going on. I don't think it's just a dialogue that's specific to West Africa. I think all over the world, people are questioning these same sort of conditions. However, um, I do think that in West Africa, it's crucial for us because our populations are so high of young people and also because we have a tremendous, tremendous amount of threats coming at us that if we don't address these sort of core issues, we're going to have bigger problems on our hands than, you know, the current ones we have. I think there's a big issue that we're not making a connection that I don't hear a lot of people making with the kind of education children aren't having and the fact that young people can't get jobs you know i think that you need a certain kind of education to be able to one create your own job two be able to be at a job three be able to know about how long you should stay at a job what you should expect or there so this question of employability i think is linked to education and I don't think we've, uh, in West Africa, I think it's, 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 it's now sort of sexy, you know, the donor money is there toward giving jobs and entrepreneurship, you know, these are all these little words, right? Ah, sexy, sexy, get the money, get the money, right? But I think the real, the reality is, if a two-year-old, three-year-old is not playing, this is not a person you want who will be able to lead a team. Is not. They won't be able to lead a team. They won't be able to even be a team player because they have missed some core experiences their brains have needed to develop. So I think we want to think about things not in isolated, like, you know, this, but really in connection, you know. Uh, I think about education in connection to health, you know. If I am to be a responsible person making critical decisions for my own health, I have to be better educated. If I'm just following what somebody tells me to do, then I'm probably not making the best decisions about my health. Because I probably can't hold somebody accountable for what they're not making available to me. So I'll give you an example. If the majority of diets for poor people are not locally sourced, it's probably related to the fact that we're not teaching agriculture to children. So there's no way that children can grow up to understand the importance of agriculture that, you know, for independence and self-sufficiency, we need to be agriculture. So for me, I feel like education is everything. How do we get people thinking differently about education, about what we're teaching children, what do we want? Sometimes I get confused because what's the citizen? What are we all going after. For me, um, we have a vision here um, in, uh, in our Imagination Africa where we talk about Africa of 2025. And we say we want it to be prosperous. We want it to be a society that's being a global, global lead in the world. Uh, we want it to be a society where individual liberty is respected as much as respect for the groups and communities. And it's really uh, 
a vision for us that pushes us toward where we want to be. And there's called something called, and actually the Sundanese government is trying to move toward it, is really about being centered on the realities of children, education being centered on the realities of children. Um, what is this, what is what is a community need? What is a community vision for itself? Um, agriculture, you know, we reduce it to farming, but it's much more complex than that. Agriculture is about how we eat, what we eat, when we eat. If I think about history and I think of somebody like Aline Sichoye Jata, you know, she was really being, and she was young, huh? right? She was young. But we really think about her being a revolutionary because she understood, hmm, if we can't grow our rice, we can't control so much. And when I look at all the health problems we have and the diets and what we're eating and what we don't eat, what we can afford to eat, what we can't afford to eat, the fact that all across Africa there's so much land, imagine what would happen if you did a project with children in a region that was once a very rich agricultural region on you know, some aspect of agriculture. What would happen? What would we wake up with them? You know, what would happen? I mean, that, it's just, for me, those are the questions you ask, is where's the projects on agriculture getting children into agriculture? You know, where are the projects getting children into forestry? Where are the projects getting children into fisheries and fish conservation? You know, those are the kind of things that get children interested in understanding the relationship that we have with the earth, with our societies, with our bodies. And, I, and I'm surprised that we're not making those connections, you know. And I think it's very important that children have relationships with technology. I mean, I think it's important. But at the same time, we can't, we have to do both, you know. We have to figure out how technology can support us in doing all those things that are there. I sometimes get worried because I feel like everybody's solution for Africa is to give each kid a tablet. You know, that'll solve everything. We you have a Google tablet, bravo. But, you know, uh, and then you can now talk about civics and morality because so I remember I have a picture of myself I won't tell you the year because I don't want you to know how old I am but I came to Ponte there's a picture of me standing in Ponte and I'm four years old and nobody knows it's Ponte because Ponte is actually cleaner a couple of years ago it was very dirty but you know where the curb is there's, there's all this trash there's none there. And nobody can recognize, like, oh, that was Ponte back then, you know? But because here we have so much of a habit, like, I, I get these kids all the time, because the kids, they eat something, they throw it. They eat something, they leave it. They, they, if you look around, we're always cleaning up after. So for me, that's also education, is where's the civics class? And everybody talks about Senegal, Setsakal, going and cleaning things, you know. I remember every morning we see old people coming and sweeping, sweeping, you know, cleaning a neighborhood up. But where is that in our education? Where do we talk about that? When you go to schools, when we used to go around with our Martian math programs, schools sometimes, where they had schools, if it was a public school, was the same place. Do you see the shot? You know, the horse carts that pick up trash very often here because sometimes the garbage service isn't good. Les charrettes would come and put it in the schoolyard. So it's almost like we don't care. <laughs> we don't care that children are going to school there. We'll put the trash there. You know, or we'll open up a school someplace where we know atoms is not clean. The fumes is there. But so we're not really thinking about it. It really is also about teacher training and how do you teach children, how do you teach teachers to, you know, that you can have certain competencies that you want children to have by a certain age. I agree with that and I think, but, but how do you 
get teachers to be creative enough. Again, there's that word creative enough to be thinking. So I was an English teacher. But, you know, c'était quoi? Go for English? Used to be the textbook. Man, listen. We would stay for Go for English. But I would look at whatever that little story was. You remember Go for English? They would have the text here, right? I would look at whatever that text was about and go get other resources. Let's do a field trip. Let's go out. Let's see this. Because it has to be living. You have to experience something. You know, so... Yeah, you have to do something different. And I think it's about teacher. I think it's about teacher training. Um, and there's a lot of initiatives to really get, uh, to be inspired teaching, to be a different kind of teacher. Because a lot of times when we say that, uh, the understanding is that we need a lot of resources. And inspired teaching doesn't mean, you have to have resources, but inspired teacher doesn't mean expensive resources. One thing we do at Imagination Africa is we use local material to create things. So, right. Learning by play is what children's brains are born to do. We are machines built for learning. Okay? We are built to learn. Okay? Our um, ability to learn is fostered through play. There's a thousand and one little activities that I can do with you all, little games that I could show you how many skills are required for play. I don't know if you saw downstairs, the children had a, a little kitchen, you know, with the mud and the sand and and when they're cooking, right, they love to cook. They imagine, they put water, they do that. You know, they're imagining, but they're also being very scientific. I'm making, you know, one told me soup. So they're telling you what are the parts of soup, you know? So it's imaginary, but it's also about recalling, it's about memory. It's about creativity, it's about understanding different parts to the whole, right? So if you're an inspired teacher, you use that as a teachable moment. You're making soup? Well, how many cups of water do you need? And voila les mats. Mats come in. You know? Let's see. Do we need four cups of water? One, two, three. Is that enough? Do we need more? Is it full or is it half? There's now we're starting to get this idea of half and full. You know, now we're starting to get toward volume and these other ideas. So in play, we have the opportunities, you know, as teachers, to really come in and say, what do we want to do? You know, how can we teach children differently? With young children, it's great. With older children, it's the same thing. Give them a project to discover. What in the research, and I don't mean research on the net, but going to talk to people. How can that also help um, children to discover, you know, and connect learning that's formal with learning that the real world requires at the same time? So teachers are so key because if you have a great teacher, everything changes. Everything changes. Yeah, and I'm really sad that uh, the educational, well, let's put it this way. Parents have had so much faith in teachers um, that they would give the teacher, it was almost like traditionally teachers were sort of the extension of the parent, right? So, you know, there's stories of the teacher bringing the kid home to tell the parent, you know, this one didn't do this or that, right? and the parents telling the teacher, you can beat this child, right? So I think it's very important that parents be welcome within that space. That we also as educators respect that parents are the first and best teacher, no matter what that parent is. Maybe the parent is educated, maybe the parent is not educated, but the parent really has to be there. So how do you support? We also have to have parents advocating. Because let me tell you, right now across Africa, parents will pay money 
for education because they don't trust the public school. So même si c'est 2000, they will pay 2000 francs to pay for private education rather than pay for public schools because they don't trust the public schools. So we have to get them in. We have to get them to understand what is quality learning. What do we mean? What kind of teachers do we want? What is the best way your child learns? How do you become an advocate for your teacher? And I think we also have to trust parents to tell us what they want for their children. Because sometimes we tell parents, ah, what do you know? It's not the best thing. And then sometimes there's some parents who we have to tell them, not everybody's going to be a doctor. Not everybody's going to do a BAC here in Senegal, it's what, BAC uh, S? Not everybody's going to fit BAC S. You know, Series? Not everybody's going to fit them Series 2. Not everybody prefer le BAC. You know, so how do we get parents to understand that and say, oh, okay, what are some other options on the table? One, learning through play. Mm -hmm. uh, learning through play from preschool, infant, preschool, primary, when we get to middle and secondary school, really doing a lot of project-based learning and experiential learning. So that's one. Two, local language, mother tongue learning, at least, and rich for at least the first six to seven years, uh, so that children have a, a, a strong foundation in their local towns. Three, getting different actors involved in education. Four, resources for quality teacher training. Uh, and I think, you said how many? Five? That's it. Any, 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 four, I said four. It's good, right? Yeah. And five, you have to value every child and every young person, at least until they're, how old are you? 25. Okay, so maybe 26. <laughs> Just joking. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's good.